Welcome back to Machine Translation. Today we're gonna start on uh, explaining how neural machine translation works by first a fairly gentle introduction into neural networks and very simple examples but that will also cover the math behind it even the math behind backpropagation training but again this is going to be a very simple example that actually has nothing to do with language so we uh, used before weighted linear combination of feature values hj and weights lambda j so if you remember when we explained phrase-based machine translation we said at the end of the day well there's a language model there's a translation model there's a reordering model and yes these are probabilistic models and there's some principal reasons to combine them in a certain way but you can also just view them as feature values that have properties and then we can weight them appropriately this gave us a formula that looked like this where we had features and then weights between them and uh, we didn't explain any mechanisms, but uh, you can read it in the Statistical Machine Translation book. Uh, there are actually some nice tuning algorithms how to set these weights. Okay. Um, that's a fairly traditional machine learning view of the world. You have, you know, some kind of classification or other prediction task you have to do. You try to find the salient features and define uh, feature functions for them uh, in, in terms of machine translation was you know some assessment how fluent the output is some assessment how much of the words are kind of captured in the translation how likely each word translation is things like that and you basically try to combine them in some way and one way to do it is with a linear combination where you have to assign weights so at the bottom we draw these as a network and this is kind of one way to illustrate neural networks so you have the uh, feature values here so this is h1 h2 h3 h4 h5 uh, which of course depend on the example you're processing right now and then you're going to have some weights which are defined by the strength of these connections and then that produces an output where you just take uh, the weighted sum. So uh, there's some limits to these kind of linear models. So we can give each feature weight, but we can't do more complex feature relationships such as the following. For instance, maybe a feature, if it's in the range of zero to five, it doesn't really matter what value it has in that range, that's equally good. But once the value goes over eight, that's bad. Uh, but then once it gets higher than 10, that doesn't really make any difference anymore. So this is a fairly nonlinear relationship. Uh, here's another very basic uh, principle example for what linear models can't do, uh, which is called XOR. Um, so this is just the kind of XOR you know, usually you know it as a Boolean function, but you can also really fill it out as a 2D functions where if uh, both x and y are positive that's bad or you know one x or one equals zero but if only one of them is good and the other one is one of them is positive and the other one is negative that's good so these are these two examples so this is x or uh, zero one equals one well, up here, this was one x or one equals zero. And then you have down here, zero x or zero equals one, uh, zero, sorry. Um, so that's x or, but uh, what linear classifiers do, they can draw uh, lines through there, but there's no way you can draw a line to separate these two areas. There's really two things you would need to draw. You need to kind of draw a line here and draw a line here. And these are not even straight lines. So XOR can't be handled with a linear classifier. Okay, so here's one way to expand linear classifiers. And that is to say, let's have not just 
the original linear classifier here, but have an intermediate layer in which each of them, each of the, uh, well, are we calling them features now? Uh, we calling them now hidden uh, states, um, hidden uh, hidden nodes. Uh, each of them is also just like a linear classifier. So it draws on all the inputs and uh, combines them with a weighted sum. So have we gained anything so far by doing this? And the answer is uh, no, because uh, we still uh, can actually factor out this linear classifier into a, just a linear classifier and end up with the same. So one thing we need in addition to make this more powerful is nonlinearity. So previously we just computed this weighted sum. So we combined feature values um, with weights and took the weighted sum. That was our score. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add a nonlinear function that takes this value that we computed earlier and uh, uh, and uh, transforms it. So here's some popular choices. Um, so 10H, um, which kind of starts out flat, has then an area where the score differences matter, and then it's flat again. Sigmoid is looks very similar, except it only has positive outputs. Here's a much simpler one called the ReLU, which is popular in machine learning just because it has uh, more uh, simpler mathematical properties. Obviously, it has kind of one non-differential uh, non point there in the middle. Uh, the sigmoid function is also called logistic function. So um, just to kind of start with some of the jargon that's being used here. So what's deep learning? Deep learning is what I just described, just with more layers. So instead of just having like an input layer, an input layer, uh, one hidden layer, and an output layer, you have some more additional layers. So what does the depth give you? So each layer is a processing step. So having multiple processing steps allow for more complex functions. So here's maybe some interesting metaphor that I found very compelling. So we do compute in traditional ways. Uh, we build computers by just putting together Boolean gates. Uh, so we have all these kind of AND, OR, NAND, NOR, Everything can be boiled down to that, what's happening inside a computer. And what makes a computer powerful is not just that it can carry out a simple NAND or NOR, but that it can do this in sequence. And if you kind of put a few of them in sequence suddenly, instead of just simple NAND NOR gates, you have things that add bits together. Uh, you have things that multiply numbers together. And all that's possibly by just because you have these Boolean gates kind of in a sequence. And a neural computer is basically doing the same thing. It has this sequence of layers. Each layer is doing rather simplistic uh, processing, definitely more powerful than Boolean gates, but still it's limited to a linear combination plus activation function. And then we can do more of these things. So therefore, deep neural networks can implement more complex functions. For instance, things like sorting of input values. Let me go through an example we're going to use now throughout of a very, very simple neural network that allows us to really look into what all these computations are that we're doing. OK, here's our neural network. So it has two input values. Um, it also has a new thing we're going to bring in here, which is also commonly used in all these networks, which is a bias unit. So this is a, another input unit, except it's always one. Um, so the benefit of that obviously is that if you have a weighted sum and the inputs are zero, the weighted sum is always going to be zero. And maybe you don't want the respond to zero, zero being the output zero. So you can shift that with a bias unit. So that's the first. Uh, so you have a hidden layer, one hidden layer with two hidden units and also a bias unit there. Um, the weight values, we just write them down on these connections between the nodes. Okay, 
and then here's the single output value. So it's a very simple neural network, it takes two floating point numbers here, outputs a floating point number there, and has one hidden layer with two hidden nodes and one bias node or bias unit. Okay, let's just try it out. Let's give it a spin. Let's see what it does. Um, let's put in here one and zero. And then you can actually go through the calculations. Oh yeah, what I didn't say in the diagram is that the activation function is a sigmoid uh, for everything. So, um, so you have the inputs here, one and zero. So we first compute this number here. So we take these two weights, 3.7, 3.7, oh, sorry. Um, we take these two weights, 3.7, they're both 3.7. Um, for both of our inputs, one input is zero, the other input um, is one. And then this is here the bias unit, which is one, always one. Um, and we multiply it with 1.5, minus 1.5. Okay, so if you just do this, it's uh, here. 3.7, that's 0, it's minus 1.5, we add that all up, that gives us 2.2. Uh, sigma of 2.2 is, well, 0 0.90. So the output of sigma is always between 0 and 1, which is also nice. Um, okay, so that's the output in this case. Um, this is... Um, uh, the second node here, same thing. Um, so now we have um, these weights here. So you want to compute this, you have these weights here. So we have the 2.9, 2.9, um, and this is for the bias term, 4.6. Um, multiply everything up. Um, that gives us then uh, minus 1.6 and uh, put that to the sigmoid gives us this value okay so what we have here afterwards is this node here has the value of 0 0.90 and this node has the value of 0 0.17 okay now we filled that in there as well and cleaned it up okay so this is where we are and now we can compute um, the final um, output node here. So that takes this 0 0.9, multiplies it with a weight, 4.5, it takes this 0 point, uh, 1 point, 0 0.17, multiplies it with minus 5.2, and then the bias term uh, multiplied with minus 2, that gives us 1.17, and uh, Passing that through the sigma, it gives us 0 0.76. Okay, so that just is fairly simple processing. So, uh, so we have to multiply um, the inputs with weights, take their sum, pass it to the sigma. That's all there is. Okay, so that's our output 0 0.76. Um, so here's different inputs we're going to try. Uh, we can try out 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Um, so we kind of treat it as binary inputs. These are the hidden values you're going to get. Uh, and these are the outputs you get. And if you round that up to the nearest integer, you get 0, 1, 1, 0. And OK, great. Um, that's actually XOR. Um, how does it work? So linear classifier can't do XOR, but our two-layer neural network here can do XOR. So one way to, to look at that is this hidden node here has high values whenever one of the values is 1, while the hidden node 1 only really has a high value when both of them are 1. And then what the final layer is doing is pretty much subtract um, hidden value one from hidden value zero. Actually, if you look at the neural network here, so here it kind of subtracts. So this is our or, this is our and, and so here we subtract 
the output from the or from the output with the end. So that's kind of a cute solution to do XOR with just, you know, ORs and ANDs, which can be done with linear classifiers. So here's the power of the neural networks, of the deep neural networks, that you can chain these processing steps together. So just like with Boolean circuits, you can do more complex computations. Um, slight detour, why are they called neural networks? What does that have to do with anything with neurons in the brain? Well, this is how a neuron in a brain looks like. Um, human brain has about a hundred billion of them, which is quite a lot. Actually, the artificial neural networks uh, that power things like machine translation have typically much less neurons, if you want to call them that. So a brain has a lot of these things, so they can probably do a lot of powerful things, as evidenced by our human activity. Um, this is how they look like. Um, so they have these things that are dendrites that are connected to other neurons. Um, then there's some nucleus here, and then it transfers information somewhere else. And then this is connected again to other neurons. So this looks a lot like our made up neuron. So we have a, a neuron that has a bunch of inputs. Here are dendrites. And then, well, it also has this long path here, but then it kind of branches out to several outputs, so the other neurons that are there. So you see the inspiration. And the, the reason why the brain works so well is because it has a lot of them. They are uh, connected throughout. So it's a very deep neural network in a way. It's uh, um, yeah, it, it's in many other ways not that close to the neural networks that we do. For instance, that information being transferred in, in brain neurons is with like just pulses and the, the, the frequency of the pulse matters while we actually transfer real valued numbers. Um, here's some more uh, neural communication. So there's information that is being transmitted via chemistry and uh, charged neurons and all that. Um, if you're interested in a lot of biological jargon, you can look that up. So some differences between brain and artificial neural networks. Well, let's look first at similarities. So this idea of having neurons and connection between neurons is definitely the same. And that learning takes place with changing uh, of the connections or the strength of the connections but not actually changing neurons themselves. So we actually never kind of take out neurons and add neurons in our brain. And when we build neural networks, artificial neural networks, we also actually don't change neurons. We don't add and delete neurons. We just change weights. And why does it work is because this is massive parallel processing. Um, but artificial neural networks are much simpler in a way. Um, the computation in neurons is vastly simplified. Also, it has discrete time steps. It's usually also the neurons are arranged in kind of um, kind of very neatly defined layers and sequences between layers. And another big thing is that we typically do some kind of supervised learning with massive number of stimuli, while the brain mostly has to do things like unsupervised learning. So the feedback that the brain gets is never that straightforward. When we do something, we get very complex feedback. We don't just get yes, no, yes, no answers for whatever we do at any given point in time. OK, this actually leads right to the question, how do we actually train these models? So, so far, we just looked at a neural network. There was there. But where do these weights come from? So this is what we're going to look at next. Uh, so we're going to get into backpropagation training in some mathematical detail um, uh, uh, that you may not want to follow and really track down to every neat little detail. But you should definitely get the overall idea behind it. OK, so. Um, 
here's uh, the computation we did with our neural network. So um, this was the computation. You put in 1 and 0, and this is the output we got. And we said, actually, what this is doing and what should should be doing is doing XOR. And XOR, the output shouldn't be 0.76. The export should be the output should be 1.0. So how can we change all these weights here? Because that's the only thing we're allowed to change so that the output is closer to 1. So you want to have it higher than 0.76. You want to have it closer to 1. How do we adjust these weights? So some key concepts uh, that we're going to delve into now in quite some detail. One is gradient descent. And the other one is backpropagation. So let's go over gradient descent. So it starts out with this statement here. The error is a function of the weights. So that's already a bit of an odd way to frame things. The way we did this computation was we had inputs and then we had functions that produced an output and the functions internally had some weights. So we, we kind of said the output is a function of the input or the model implements is a function XOR. Now we're gonna take a slightly different view of this thing and saying, well, the inputs are given, the output is given, but maybe the weights can be changed. So the weights now suddenly become the variables. So if you view the weights as the variables that can be changed, then you can look at the error as a function of the weights. And if you say the weight should be different, then you would have a different error. So it's a very different view of what this calculation is. So now input and outputs are given, they're fixed values, but the weights are uh, changeable. So the error can be viewed as a function of the weights. We want to reduce the error. And gradient descent, descent means we're going to move towards some kind of error minimum. So we have a function. We can look at all the possible uh, weight values, so values for the weights. Um, that gives us a function. So we have you know, different values for the weights. So here's our lambdas that differ. We have different values for them. And we have different error then. So we get a different error out. So we, we want to get to that minimum. So we might be here. This is our weight setting that we started with, and we want to get here. So that requires us to compute the gradient where we are and then figure out, yes, we should move in this direction, not that direction. So here we should decrease the weight, not the other way around. So we then are unable to adjust weights towards direction of lower error. Um, okay, that's one idea. Um, the other idea building on that is, for, so if you can do that, well, we can uh, adjust the weights of the last layer with that because that clearly has a very clearly defined uh, error because we know what the output should be. But for the intermediate stages, we don't know what the intermediate values should be or the values at the hidden nodes. So this is where backpropagation comes in, which uh, is a principled method to propagate the error back to the previous layers and that allows us to adjust the weights there as well. So here's the picture I just drew uh, a little bit neater. So we're varying the weights. So these are all the weights we're varying with different weight settings to get different errors. And uh, this is where we are currently, and we want to move towards the optimal, and we follow the gradient. So this assumes that this is a neatly shaped curve where we just follow a downward slope. We're fine. Another simplification, obviously, in this chart is uh, it only has a single weight, and we have even in our simple example we had like probably around a dozen weights. And uh, so this is a really a highly dimensional space we're operating in. Uh, so here's it written down as a two-dimensional space, which is still still only trying to go somewhere. Uh, but it should illustrate a little bit that we're going to move towards the optimum. But if there's a steeper curve, 
in some direction, we're going to move um, uh, further in the steeper direction here for the weight one than in the weight two. Um, another fun question, why don't we just set it to the optimum? Uh, because, well, we have all this now just encountering one input and output example. So given one input and output example, yes, we could set things to an optimum, but then the next output example, it would be a different optimum, we would just jump around with optimal weight settings for each individual example. And that's not gonna help us to generalize. Okay, here is a math cheat sheet for the derivation of the sigmoid. Um, I'm just gonna put that up here for completeness sake. So we had this activation function, the sigmoid. Uh, we're gonna do now a lot of uh, derivatives because we have to compute the gradients. And so we also need to compute the derivative of the sigmoid. Um, and here is the definition of the sigmoid. And then there's a lot of math um, that ultimately going to give us that the derivative of the sigmoid is actually the sigmoid x times 1 minus the sigmoid. Um, feel free to kind of work through that or just believe it. Okay, so we'll start with a final layer update. So uh, which has the following mathematical operations. So we have this linear combination of weights. Um, so this is our hidden node values here. These are the weights for the hidden weight, how much it impacts the, the, um, the sum, the weighted sum. This is what we then gonna pass through the sigmoid and that gives us this y, that's actually the output. But then we also have the error. We haven't talked too much about the error. So the error, we could say that's a difference between t and y. Um, if you just take that subtraction, we can run into the problem that sometimes it's a positive number and sometimes a negative number, and we really just want it to be zero and we don't care if it's positive or negative. It's equally bad. So one way to deal with that is to square it then no matter if it's positive or negative, it's always going to be a positive number and a lower number is better. So that's one thing to do. It's called the L2 norm. This half is really there for kind of mathematical trickery that's going to come out in a second. Okay, so this is what we want. This is how we define our problem. We have the error that we computed here and we wanted to say that that's a function of the weights. And you can actually multiply all that out and then you're going to get the function of the weights. And we want to compute that. And here's the first thing we do. And that is actually the big powerful thing that drives the whole thing across. And then we're going to go into a lot more in the next lecture, which is we can break that up into uh, basically following these computations we have here. So we can compute the derivative of the error in, with respect to the output value y, and then we compute the derivative of the output value y with respect to the weighted sum s, and we compute the derivative of the weighted sum s with respect to the weight values. So this is called the chain rule, and this is the thing that really makes all this work pretty well. As I said, next lecture we're going to go into more detail about what the chain rule enables. So, um, quick foreshadowing. Um, this is a very mechanical application of derivation. So everybody kind of still remembers derivation from high school that kind of requires consulting big books of rules and fiddling and trying and following different strategies. So that seems to require a lot of brain power. But uh, since uh, in neural networks, we chain together operations, we can actually use this chain rule for pretty much everything and then the whole thing can actually be automated. So all the math we're going to do over the next pages, we're going to do it to make clear how it works, but you actually never have to do this math yourself. Okay, let's just go through that and in some detail how that is then works out in this case. Um, 
so we have uh, again our four function three functions here three uh, operations that we chain together and now we want to compute this and we're going to go through it one by one so first thing we're going to look at is this here there is the error with respect to the output value y so we take the derivative with respect to the output value y so what is that function that is this function here so we put that in here and taking that to y uh, gives us this here so you can um, multiply that out if you want to have a bit more detail you can first multiply that out uh, so that is minus 2 uh, uh, y uh, ty plus y square and then you have that half in front of it still so and then you take the derivative of that and you end up with this here at the end um, why because the derivative of this here becomes zero the derivative of this here becomes minus 2t and the derivative of this here becomes uh, 2y i hope you still remember that a little bit from high school um, and the uh, yeah, here is also and the reason why we have this half in here because we have a two here and we have a two here and that half now easily now allows us to get rid of that so we are left with minus t plus y or minus t minus y okay um, we'll go over the detail for the next ones too but you kind of get the idea so this is a uh, now, just a simple, we, we, all, we only operate a very simple function, so it's relatively uh, straightforward to do the derivatives for these same functions. Um, next one is sigmoid. Um, we already went through um, the, the homework exercise of computing the derivatives for the sigmoid, and uh, this is what we got. Um, next one is the weighted sum. Um, so this is now we're gonna interest we're interested in multiple values for each weight. We're actually now gonna do this computation for each weight separately, and it's a linear sum. So what's the derivative of a linear sum? Well, if only one of the weights is now a variable, um, then only one of them actually is the thing we're going to take a derivative over so we're left with that hk for all the other weights these are fixed constants that when you take the derivatives fall out and disappear okay and putting all this together as i said we have to multiply all these three things so this is the first thing we had this is the second thing we had this is the third thing we had um, um, this could be called here also the error and this is the derivative of the sigmoid here and then this is our weight adjustment formula so basically we're moving against the gradient so that's why that minus sign here disappears otherwise um, yeah we just kind of wrote down here the derivative of the sigmoid with derivative of the sigmoid and hk so these are all values you can compute uh, then there's also this thing of called the learning rate where well how far how strongly do we move towards um, against the derivative against the gradient and that's uh, kind of scales it that's usually a relatively small number like 0 0.001 or something like this Okay, um, if you have multiple output nodes, that doesn't really make things any different. You just have um, multiple TJs, and you just do this computation for each separately. So um, here, if the error is, is defined as the sum over um, uh, over all the errors on a word level, then you can actually really then basically all the things not associated with one particular error term falls out. So this is then the weight update formula. Um, the hidden layer, are you basically going to keep doing this? Um, here's some math about how it turns out. Um, so it, it, the computation is quite similar 
um, where we have this error term for each hidden node um, that turns out to be this calculation. So we just kind of back propagate further down where we're just going to compute the error with respect to the, pre to the subsequent calculations. Uh, it's pretty much uh, fairly intuitive if you look at it. So that error term is pretty much how much um, a particular term impacted the overall error downstream. But I think it's, it's not necessary to view this kind of in an intuitive way, like how much did this hidden node and contribute to the ultimate error. Maybe also it's better to view it as just a purely mecha mechanical application of chain rules. So this is our error term. So uh, we, we this kind of corresponds to the error term we had here. Um, and uh, then we have this universal update formula. So no matter where we are, we're always going to have some kind of error term. And then the, way, the value at that point of the node and the update value. OK, um, here's now a lot of gory math about how this turns out for this particular example, just to kind of reinforce the idea of the calculations that are being done. So here's our output, 0.76. We should have gotten 1.0. So that's the error term um, for the gradient update calculation. So we take the difference between the two and multiply it with the derivative of the sigmoid. Uh, that turns out to be 0 0.1.8. Um, and that gives us this value. So this uh, captures here, we, we actually have the derivative of the segment. If you remember the formula with that, we applied it to the weighted sum that was computed at that point. And then we have given this error term, these are our update formulas, uh, where yeah, the, the learning rate here is now massively high, just to kind of get some numbers out that actually move the needle. So we have the update learning rates here. This is always the same error term. And then these are the different values. Um, so this is the 0.9 that impacts how much we update this value. This is 0.17. This is going to impact how much we change this one. This is one. So how much we're going to update this weight. So with these updates, we would now change the, the values here according to these uh, updated numbers. So now we can basically back propagate from here to um, the, the, how to update all these weights here. So this is now uh, a backpropagation step. Again, we don't have any real errors here, but we kind of backpropagated the error. So we know an error for here, and you can actually see what the error terms are here. So for uh, the node D, the error term turns out to be this here, 0 0.0175. And for E, the error term is negative 0.0464. So this then allows us to kind of put this into the same kind of formula, learning rate times that error term times um, the value. The value is either 1 or 0, one zero. and for the bias term is also 1. And these are then um, the update weights, and so on and so on. So that now tells us how to update these weights. OK, um, let me just go over some additional aspects. Um, so one is, oh, well, this 
tells us how to update weights, but where do we get weights from, from initially? Well, we're gonna initially randomize uh, all the weights. So we gotta have assign random values. We're not gonna assign everything to zero because then all the computations at the beginning was gonna be pointless. And also it's gonna have the drawback that you have exactly the same operations for all hidden values. So that's not good. So you need to have in random initialization. So we're going to draw random numbers uniformly from some interval, but what is the in interval? And there's some magic formulas here where you get the initial values from. So um, for a shallow neural network that has uh, only a few layers, um, this is uh, what you should take. So it basically comes down to how many, how, how big the layers are, how many nodes you have in a layer. Obviously, if you have a lot of nodes and a value, you add up a lot of numbers, so that's going to have bigger impact. So you want to have these well, the, the weights kind of scale down then uh, these values, so you don't get massive large weighted sums afterwards. So that's a magic formula here for deep neural networks that looks at um, the previous layer size and the next layer size. So this is the magic formula for that. Um, also, let's just introduce this. Um, uh, so what we currently just computed was XOR, which has a, had an individual output value. We are also, in the case of machine translation, interested in something that's closer to a classification task, where it says, um, for instance, let's just put that here. We want to predict either the word cat or the word dog or the word fish. And uh, only one of them is correct. And the way we do this is when we say we want to predict the word cat, we're just going to say this is going to be 0 and 0, and this is going to be 1. Um, this is called a one hot vector uh, because it has one, it's only hot on one of the values. It only has this one on, on one of the values, otherwise, it's 0. So at the end, we want to make a prediction. So ideally, we would actually like to compute probabilities. You would say like, well, we maybe 0.05, our model thinks this, but it's actually pretty certain that it should be fish. So maybe that's an output. We want our model to make predictions over, and we want to then further improve it. So how do we get out of weighted sums numbers like this, um, this is where the softmax comes in. So this is an activation function that operates on these values and then outputs um, uh, values that add up to one. Um, here's another um, aspect of what does this always work? Well, it doesn't always work, and there's the mistakes you can make. One is that if your learning rate is too high and you move towards the gradient, you might just overshoot your goal and you kind of jump around. So that's a problem. Another one is um, if you start in a very flat region of a curve, which is quite possible with things like sigmoid, it just the gradients are really, really small here. So you also move only really, really slowly anywhere. So the action is really only happening here. So whenever you have weights that kind of put you into this part of the curve, you get very, very slow improvements. So that might also happen. Another one is if the, is the activation function is um, has local optima, you might get trapped in there. Um, this is a bit of a hand wavy um, uh, illustration of this problem. Um, the activation functions that we looked at actually don't look like this. They all have just one optimum. And um, so you actually never run into this problem. But uh, what you definitely have the problem with is that you have lots and lots of weights. So it's a highly dimensional space uh, surface uh, area. And if you look at this highly dimensional area with thousands, thousands of weights, it's actually quite bumpy and has a lot of local optima in that highly dimensional area. OK, um, so there's some speed up techniques. Um, uh, one is called momentum term. We're actually going to go into how to improve kind of this learning setup, the optimization. 
which is the problem of taking the gradients and then actually transforming them into updates for weights. Uh, one early uh, proposal was using of a momentum term. So if a weight made move slightly, but always in the same direction, uh, then we can just basically speed up that process. So we keep a memory of the prior updates. So we just kind of store the memory of the prior updates and add them to the next update. So we kind of keep factoring in the updates. So, and then these um, weight updates that we kind of keep a memory, uh, we kind of add the more re most recent update and kind of scale down the previous updates to it. Here is Adagrad, which is a more sophisticated way of doing it. Um, so typically in, in learning, we're going to reduce the learning rate over time. So at the beginning, we want to do a lot of changes, but later only, f only kind of finely tune the thing. So at the beginning, all the weights are just horribly wrong. So we, they need to be changed a lot. But towards the end, the weights are generally in the right area. They just need to be kind of twiddled a little bit. So we're just fine tuning these things at this point. And uh, what Adagrad is doing is um, it's adapting the learning rate per parameter. So it has basically um, um, a learning rate that gets updated at any given point in time. Uh, so here is the Adagrad update. So usually you have this gradient and a fixed learning rate. But now this fixed learning rate further gets uh, manipulated with here, uh, a sum over all the previous gradients. So we go over the previous time steps, and then based on that, you you downscale the learning rate. What does that do? If a weight has been changed already a lot, we later, so these gradients then going to be pretty high. So we're not going to change the weight that much afterwards anymore. So a weight that already has been changed a lot, we don't change it that much. A weight that hasn't been changed much so far, is going to get changed only very little. Uh, there's some other crazy ideas. One is uh, dropout. So very general problem in machine learning is that you overfit to the data. Um, so you train models that are very good on the training data, but bad on unseen test data. And the solution to that is a regularization, uh, which makes sure that weights don't have extreme values. Um, dropout is a somewhat crazy scheme where during training you just remove some of the hidden units. So you run it on some examples and then remove extra some hidden units and all the associated weights from processing and, uh, uh, and then update them. So whatever a particular unit learned to do now has to be made up for by the other units. So this allows you to get a bit more redundancy and is a successful technique. Um, there are some arguments why this works. Uh, there are things in machine learning literature called bagging or assemble learning that follow similar intuition that once you remove weights, you actually have a different classifier and combining multiple classifiers is generally a good idea. Um, so with the way we talked about this so far is that we walked through one in specific learning example that gives us a set of weight updates. So it gave us an update for each weight. But we could also process multiple training examples um, and then sum up their updates and then apply the combined update to the model. This is mostly done for speed reasons, but it generally also works better than just applying individual updates for each single um, training example. Um, let me finish up with um, a little bit on computational aspects. Um, so here's a slightly different view on the calculations we did. Um, so we've, these are still the same calculations, but now we kind of phrase them in terms of vector and matrix computation. So all these things with a little error on top of it are a vector. So we have multiple hidden values. So there's a vector of hidden values. And we have weights that go from these hidden values to kind of maybe a set of weighted sums for the next layer. 
So we have a bunch of matrix weights, and they actually they can be organized in a matrix. So this is a, a taking a vector of hidden values, multiplies with a weight matrix, and outputs a vector of output values. That's just the the linear sum. Um, the activation function could also be defined on on a vector, although then it operates on each element individually. You know, the error term, this is now also written as a vector calculation. And here the propagation of the error term and so on and so on. So everything here is, is either vector or matrix uh, computation. And this is um, where GPUs come in, so graphical processing units. So neural network layers have maybe 200 nodes. Uh, there may be 500,000. It depends very much on the architecture you have. But let's say you have 200 nodes and uh, both on the layer and the subsequent layer. So then this weight matrix here has 200 times 240,000 uh, multiplications that it has to do. So each time you multiply a weight with the input value for to compute the output for a particular value in the output vector. That's 40,000 multiplications. So that's a long for loop. Uh, but that's also something that GPUs are really good at. Uh, they're very good at this kind of calculations where you apply the same calculation to multiple data items. So single instruction multi-data is another jargon term for that. Um, why GPUs and what does that have anything to do with what we're talking about? Is because yeah, they, in in image rendering you have exactly the same kind of calculations you have to do. Think about it, a computer game where you have to show pixels on a screen. Your your screen is how many a thousand times a thousand or two thousand pixels. I don't know what your screen is these days. Um, each has to be for each of you, you have to compute RFGB values. And they're all somewhat independent of each other. They all follow from the same computation. So you have this massive matrix of output values that you have to compute from all kinds of previous processing. But it's the same operation for the pixel on the pixel next to it, except it takes slightly different inputs. It's the same mathematical operations applied to different values. And this is the same thing we have to do here. We have the same operation here, these weighted uh, linear sum, linear weights, computations, and so on applied to multiple data items and that's what gpus are good for so they're massively multi-core but do very simple processing so here is an example actually a super outdated gpu uh, that has uh, 2496 so this year 2020 i think the latest nvidia gpu came out with 10,000 thread processors so you have basically 10,000 computations being done simultaneously um, except uh, you're somewhat limited. These 10,000 operations are typically then exactly the same operation applied to multiple data items. Um, there are, if you're interested in programming on GPUs directly, um, there's something called CUDA for uh, if you program in C++. Um, nowadays, modern toolkits just take care of all this underlying processing for you. You just run it and you don't even know if it runs on a CPU or a GPU. It just becomes the switch of one of your configuration settings. Um, so this is what, what is happening today. There's all these toolkits out. Um, there are There's a bit of a convergence of toolkits. There used to be an explosion of toolkits. Um, I'd say the most prominent right now is either PyTorch or TensorFlow. Um, so they basically allow you to do a lot of this neural network engineering that we have to do and that we're going to go into more detail in the next lecture without actually having to worry about computing gradients by hand and coming up with a math by yourself. Okay, and um, that's it for today. And uh, yeah, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into how we can build really complicated neural networks and who is going to take care of the math for us to do all these backpropagation gradient update calculations. And we'll do that in the next lecture.